for once I don't have to lower the microphone. <laughs> also, no one mispronounced my name. <laughs> my name is Eva Gelfern, and I'm here to talk to you about something very important, a contraption that once ruled my life. I'm here to talk to you about the bicycle, my nemesis. Now, I'm five foot three. I was born in Riga, Latvia, and I, ladies and gentlemen, did not learn to ride a bicycle as a child. We lived on a very steep hill, okay? So I didn't get a bike until I was in my 20s. And when I did, I may have prioritized aesthetics over practicality and bought a large, heavy cruiser, which was about as easy to steer as a cow. I decided that I would ride this bike from my house to the office across the flatlands of Soma, through the city's most dangerous intersections, past murderous cars like a good little bicycle commuter. And so I wobbled to and fro a couple of times, and I fell. I fell a lot. I scraped my knees and my palms, and I bumped into parked cars, and eventually, well, and by eventually I mean day three, uh, I rather spectacularly gave myself a grade two ankle sprain, which I walked on all the way home, which in case you've never sprained your ankle, does not make it better. <laughs> and let's just say that I did not ride a lot of bicycles after that. This, my friends, is not a story about that bicycle. Or my ankle. <laughs> so the first bicycles with pedals in our, the year of our Lord, Mumbly to Gook, 1870-something, uh, were also called velocipedes, or velocipede uh, in Russian, uh, date from somewhere in the 1870s. Uh, they were referred to as bone shakers because they were so cozy and comfortable to ride. <laughs> this was caused by their stiff wrought iron frame and wooden wheels surrounded by tires made of iron. So comfy. The bicycle you see here is called a penny farthing, also known as a high wheel or a high wheeler or an ordinary bicycle back before it became an extraordinary bicycle. These bicycles were popular in the 1870s and 80s with a large front wheel providing high speeds because you get a lar uh, large distance for every rotation of your legs when you pedal. Uh, the, num the name comes from the British penny and farthing coins and uh, I'm pretty sure you can guess uh, what their relative sizes were. This is not very complicated. Uh, so you get this side view that resembles a penny leading a farthing. So, <laughs> you may have noticed these things are not easy to ride. Uh, penny farthing bicycles are dangerous due to the risk of headers, <laughs> taking a fall over the handlebars head first. Makers developed mustache handlebars, thus also the handlebar mustache, um, allowing the rider's knees to clear them as they headed over the, uh, uh, headed over the bicycle in order to make it easier to fall on your face. <laughs> the 1870s were not exactly the epitome of engineering, ladies and gentlemen. So, as you may have guessed, bicycles were not for the ladies. They were considered masculine ac accessories. Uh, the primary reason for this is that they could not be ridden side saddle which was considered the only proper way for a woman to ride anything. <laughs> women of the era who rode astrode horses rather than side on were widely mocked as weird and unfeminine. It was also impossible to mount, much less ride one of these things in an ankle length skirt. Uh, riding a bicycle required agility, dexterity, and courage. Even if you weren't competing for speed and distance, it was considered a sport. The first long distance races were staged in France as early as the late 1860s, uh, shortly after the introduction of the Velocipede. Um, there, eh? Eh? everything gets complicated for a moment. <laughs> Many contraptions, they totally make sense. Uh, use the two finger trick, he said. It will totally cause the thing to scroll. Um, 
So anyway, they had, uh, they had cycle racing. Uh, there were special indoor and outdoor tracks. Uh, and uh, this was all commercialized and uh, media covered as sort of this mass spectator sport. This is not a story about that bicycle. No, no. This is a story about the rover safety bicycle. This is a rover safety bicycle from 1885, made in England. Um, th this is the forerunner of today's bikes in both appearance and popularity. The safety had front and back wheels of equal size, making it easier to mount, especially for less agile riders or those in skirts. It had a sprocket and a chain attached to the rear wheel, which afforded better propulsion and braking, and it had pneumatic rubber tires invented in 1888 to provide a smoother ride than, say, I don't know, wood. Um, for the upper and middle class white women of late 19th century Europe and North America, the safety bicycle was revolutionary. At the height of the cult of domesticity, which worshipped white upper and middle class women as the ministering angel of the home and gave them very little that, that they could acceptably do outside of it, the bicycle granted women mobility. A woman could move quickly, far, and without a chaperone. She could exercise in public. <laughs> the bicycle was so popular with women that by 1897, the League of American Wheelmen counted more than 22,000 women among its ranks, a full third of the organization's national membership. Now, these are fashion plates from the 1880s, and I don't know about you, but it's pretty damn hard to even get on a safety bicycle wearing one of these. So, riding a safety bicycle in an ankle-length gown, corset, and petticoat, not easy. Victorian clothing was restrictive. And whether you're looking at the 1850s and their enormous hoop skirts, like Gone with the Wind, or it's the 1880s and Baby Got Bustle, women's clothing <laughs> was too long, too big, too ponderous, and too tight for comfort while bicycling. Hundreds of years before Lululemon, ladies and gentlemen. In 1891, a woman in Sporting Life magazine recalled how she was once skimming along like a bird when she felt an awful tug at her skirt and hit the ground. <laughs> Thud. My dress was so tightly wound around the crank bracket that I could not get up until I had got it free. I'm pretty sure that's how it went. <laughs> Enter dress reform. Uh, the woman that you see here is Mrs. Amelia Jenks Bloomer. She caused quite a bit of a stir when she wrote an article for her feminist publication, The Lily. She tried to promote the idea of women abandoning their petticoats for a bifurcated garment that came to be known as the Bloomer. She suggested that women would find trousers like those worn by Turkish women easier to wear than their voluminous heavy skirts. The baggy trouser outfit was worn by a minority, including the Rational Dress Reform Society. Uh, the Rational Dress uh, Society formed in 1881 in London. Uh, the society was formed by Viscountess Haberton and Mrs. King. They drew attention to restrictive corsetry and the immobility caused by fashions of the day. The Rational Dress Society also sold boneless stays and promoted fashion that did not deform the body. It no it never gained popularity until after Mrs. Bloomer's death. Uh, Mrs. Bloomer herself abandoned trousers in 1857 when she admitted she found the cage crinoline comfortable compared to the weight of petticoats. So the tie between bicycles, uh, which made women don more masculine dress and go out into the world, and the increasingly strong women's equality movement across Europe and the United States did not go unnoticed. Uh, either by suffragettes or by, as you can see here, cartoonists. Uh, the late 19th and early 20th centuries were filled with caricatures of lady bicyclists doing such ridiculous things as smoking, rushing off to protests, or trying to get the vote, uh, often while wearing masculine clothing and leaving their husbands at home with the baby. Bicycle riding women were seen as exemplars of the new woman who didn't necessarily want to have children, be deprived of a career, or have no political voice, and were accordingly praised and or browbeaten as such. New women and bikes were so symbolic that when Cambridge undergrads protested the admission of women in 1897, they did it by hanging up an effigy of a woman on a bicycle. 
charming. Just as women on bicycles were simultaneously liberating and threatening, bicycling was simultane simultaneously healthy and unhealthy for the gentler sex. Some doctors argued that bicycling was an excessively taxing activity, unsuitable for women, leading to exhaustion, insomnia, heart palpitations, headaches, and depression. Traditionalists hated the idea of the bicycle as an instrument that would instigate a sexual awakening, whether personal, as many people expressed trepidation about a woman straddling a bicycle seat and experiencing the shocks and vibrations of the road, <laughs> or socially, as bicycles gave women the freedom to escape the watchful eyes of parents and chaperones. Basically, it was a 19th century vibrator. <laughs> and, of course, the greatest risk of all Bicycle face. <laughs> bicycle face was a, a condition in which a woman would look red, strained, exhausted, with dark circles under her eyes. Actually, doctors could never really decide what bicycle face looked like. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of different stories about exactly what the problem is, but your face is definitely going to freeze that way if you keep riding that bicycle young lady. <laughs> Which brings me to my favorite part of this talk. This is Annie Londonberry. So this one time in the 1890s, uh, two Bostonians were sitting around their club discussing uh, women. Uh, these were men, obviously. Uh, one asserted that the modern woman could do just about anything a man could do, and his companion took the bait. They shook on a wager that a woman could ride a bicycle around the world in 15 months and earn $5,000 along the way. A surprisingly specific bet. <laughs> it's not really clear what led Annie Londonberry, Lond sorry, Londonberry, uh, born Annie Kupchowski, Kupchowski? Kupchowski, uh, born Annie Kupchowski uh, to decide that this is something that she wanted to do. Um, but she was likely caught up in the craze of women who were using this vehicle to express their new freedoms. Um, in June 27th of 1894, the 24-year-old Kupchowski hopped on her 42-pound Columbia women's bike, wearing the long skirt corset and high collar of the time. Perhaps creating the first Mr. Mom, she waved goodbye to her husband and three small children and some fans from the local cycling club as she headed off to New York. One newspaper reported her departure saying that she had sailed away like a kite down the street. She carried with her only a change of clothes, a pearl-handled pistol, and a whole lot of chutzpah. <laughs> the London Dairy Lithia Spring Water Company offered her $100, and in, uh, in return for their sponsorship, she agreed to carry their placard on her bike and adopt the name Annie London Dairy, which is fine because even I can't pronounce Kopchowski correctly. From New York, she rode to Chicago, arriving on September 24th. By then, she had lost 20 pounds and realized that if she was going to continue, she was going to have to make some changes. First, the bicycle was too heavy, so she switched to a 21-pound sterling model with a man's frame, one gear, and no brakes. <laughs> Not science. <laughs> Second, she acknowledged that it was impossible to ride a man's bike in women's attire, so she donned bloomers. And then eventually wore a man's riding suit for the rest of the trip. Her original plan was to continue riding west, uh, but winter made it necessary for her to switch direction. She rode back to New York and sail sailed to Le Havre, Fran France, arriving there in early December. Things did not go well at first. Her bike was impounded by customs officials. Her money was stolen. The French press, not a coffee maker, declared that she was too muscular to be a woman thereby assigning her the category of neutered beings. <laughs> but somehow she was able to turn things around and despite inclement weather, she made it from Paris to Marseille in two weeks via cycling and train. In Marseille, Londonderry, as she was now known, boarded the steamship Sydney. Her ports of call included Alexandria, Colombo, not the detective, Singapore, Saigon, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Nagasaki, and Kobe, where she did not stop for beef. To prove that she had actually been there, she had to get the signature of the United States Consul in every location. 
Uh, Londonderry, upon uh, her eventual return to Boston, uh, wrote a book. She went into the journalism business. She spent a whole lot of time uh, telling tall tales, so it's not really clear how much of her story uh, is true. Uh, and she died in 1947, uh, having traveled all over the world as a badass with a Pearl Hander pistol. <laughs> Suffragettes embraced bicycles both symbolically and physically. Uh, popular Women's Monthly, Godies, uh, declared in 1890 that there is something of every class uh, have welcome as a shorter road to freedom than wide welcoming college doors or open gateways to the polls. But there were also practical means for campaigning and drawing attention. Uh, English suffragettes in particular would ride around on bicycles with votes for women banners. Uh, and uh, the suffragette movement I mean, it had its own special bicycle. In 1909, an advertisement for it in the colors of the suffrage movement, purple, white, and gold, for those of you who are wondering. Uh, and with a medallion of freedom appeared in the pages of the magazine, Votes for Women. I'm not really sure what they wanted. <laughs> Susan B. Anthony once said to Nellie Bly, uh, these are both women who definitely deserve their own talks, uh, let me tell you what I think of bicycling. I think that it has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. I stand and rejoice every time I see a woman ride by on a wheel. The moment she takes her seat, she knows she can't come to harm unless she gets off her bicycle. And away she goes, the picture of free, untrammeled womanhood. <laughs> and the, com the uh, connection between freedom of movement and the bicycle does not stop there. Uh, in Yemen, where a combination of fuel shortages and cultural barriers to women cycling have left many unable to get around, uh, photographer Bushra al Faisal uh, launched a campaign to encourage women to get out on their bikes and break the taboo. The campaign received a huge amount of attention, with conservatives raising the familiar complaint that cy cycling is immodest for women, possibly because they are huge vibrators. Um, and meanwhile, the British charity Recycle is proving uh, is providing women in various countries across Africa with bikes as a safer and quicker mode of transport than walking. And so, at last, I ask all of you to raise a glass, a toast, a Victorian toast, to suffragettes, to bloomers, to pearl-handled pistols, and not taking no for an answer when you get on the contraption. Let's give it up for Eva. All right. How does this thing work? Oh, you missed a, you missed the toast slide at the end there. Wow. Okay. We're gonna just need a minute here to get ready for our next speaker. Ooh, Steen! Everyone, give it up for Steen. <laughs> ceiling Steen is in your ceiling doing things. Uh oh. Okay. Wait. Okay. Hang on. I'm moving too. <laughs> ah. You know, we're going to do a talk at some point on how the world is held together with cables.